Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. Kurt Cobain himself has said on many occasions that lyrics often didn't really matter to him. Yet, there are of course many examples of where Kurt's lyrics were so specific, it's highly unlikely he didn't put any particular thought into writing at least some of his lyrics. As a matter of fact, it's objectively not true that he didn't care about his lyrics at all. There are many songs where he's openly spoken about how he wrote specific things about specific people. So basically, take it with a grain of salt whenever you hear people say that Kurt didn't care about his lyrics because while that's true to an extent, there are many instances where he certainly did care. In this video, I'm going to read to you a very detailed analysis of Kurt Cobain's development lyrically over the years. It's a really interesting piece. This piece takes a look at basically his writing from fecal matter in 1986 all the way through to 1994 in his last year of his life. The types of songs he wrote, whether it was in the first person, etc. It's an extremely detailed analysis, which I'll be sharing with you just in a bit. But first, I want to show you a clip from one of my interviews with Nirvana producer Jack and Dino, where he himself discusses Kurt Cobain's lyrics. Here's the clip. One of the things that just like in like online Nirvana communities that there's a lot of debate about is how seriously did Kurt take lyrics? Because Kurt sometimes would say publicly he didn't really prepare lyrics, he didn't really care, but then some people say, no, he was very diligent with writing lyrics. In your experience, did he care a lot about the lyrics for his songs? I do know that during the Bleach sessions, there were a few songs that he literally had to stop and finish the lyrics for, like right then and there. Or maybe he had like some some lines floating around in his head, but until it was time to actually do the real vocals, he hadn't crystallized it to be like, this is what the lines are going to be. And he would have to sit down for a minute and think, okay, what's the verse really going to be? I've been singing this nonsense, but now I've got these lines in my head. Let's figure it out. So he did actually finalize some of the lyrics uh, right in front of me when we were doing the, the Bleach session. And I think he did that a little bit on the Dale demo as well. But I think it was more a case of just remembering what the heck the, what the lyrics were that he already knew. Um, I do know that when we were doing rape me for the in utero demos he did have to sit down and he was actually trying some lines out while i was in the studio there and he was running them by courtney he's going what do you think should i use this line or that line and she'd be like yeah that line no use this line and she'd be like yeah you're right that's a better line so he was like you know he was open to opinions but you know but he had the lines he would just he always had to sit down and go am i going to sing it this way or am i going to sing it this way because mm -hmm. there'd always be a few optional phrasings in his head you know mm -hmm. but um i think it's fairly obvious from reading the lyrics that he spent more time on the lyrics to in utero than he did on some of the other lyrics because i think the lyrics just show that there's more thought in them at that point maybe because he was more self-conscious which i think is very likely because he was very self-conscious after nevermind was a success mm -hmm. um I know nothing about how he wrote the lyrics for Nevermind because I wasn't really present for that. But it did seem a little more casual during the Bleach and the Dale demo sessions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think he had the lyrics written out, but, you know, I don't think he was particularly self-conscious about it and maybe not even that ambitious about it. I am, I am impressed that he was able to write a song like School that has three lines in it. <laughs> And there's a brilliant song with, yeah, only, it's a very with good song. only three lines in that song. Yeah. That is some economical songwriting right there that is is a lesson for people. That you can tell a whole story with very few words. I want to read to you an article from journalist Nick Soulsby, where he takes a detailed look at the evolution of Kurt Cobain's lyrics over the years. Later in this video, I'm also going to show you a clip from one of my interviews with Nirvana producer Jack Endino, where he himself discusses Kurt Cobain's lyrics. But first, here's the article. This is from nirvanalegacy.com. Quote, In the literary world, it's normal that a sophisticated writer's output is dissected to indicate the structural, time-specific, and or constant features underpinning what they do. The world of popular music, however, often falls prey to anti-intellectualism. A common knee-jerk reaction claiming that any deeper consideration either neuters the emotive force of music, is inappropriate to the form, or is purely imaginary unless confirmed by an artist's own statements. It's a bizarre reaction in many ways. In the case of Cobain, 
The starkest example I can offer is the way in which his songwriting noticeably changes between 1986 and 1994. Think of any singer you wish. Compare Beck to Axl Rose. Compare 90s Wu-Tang Clan to the hashtag disorientation of mid-2000s Lil Wayne. Whatever you wish. Every performer of words has a voice. There are a range of options. First person, third person, the story, interior monologues, direct address to an unknown audience. Emotional sensation versus external reportage. Lyrics require a mode, regardless of thought or forethought. Kurt Cobain is an excellent subject to study in this regard. A concise selection of song lyrics to consider, showing development across a tight eight-year span. Some songs recorded for the Fecal Matter demo at Easter of 86 may have been around a long while, but without further evidence, it's pure conjecture. In my opinion, given how fast Cobain wrote, used, and discarded songs from 1986 to 1990, I doubt he was reusing leftovers from his early to mid-teens. In essence, there are three clearly distinguishable threads to Cobain's lyric writing, and they change significantly in terms of their presence and importance within his portfolio. The first is the story, defined as a narrative, scene, or experience played out across an entire song. This approach takes a lot of work. Essentially, it means writing a short story in a relatively limited number of words while making it work as a vocal piece. Paper Cuts from Bleach is a great example. When I'm feeling tired, she pushed food through the door, and I crawl towards the crack of light. Sometimes I can't find my way, newspapers spread around, soaking all that they can, a cleaning is due again, a good hosing down. The first evidence of Kurt using this mode of writing comes on the Fecal Matter demo in 1986 with the track Insurance, a court scene and it's very understandable why it never becomes a dominant component of his writing. It's difficult and time-consuming. The next example is ready a year later by the time of Nirvana's first show, Mexican Seafood, a slightly feverish sequence in which he winds up focusing on the state of the bathroom floor and the toilet bowl. 1987 is the big year for story songs. Kurt Cobain has the time and freedom to work on them. So by the time Nirvana's first ever studio session, January 88 at Reciprocal, he's worked up Floyd the Barber and Paper Cuts with Polly, likely already in hand given the song is based on a 1987 news story. This song form then dies entirely. The final two examples are written in May to July of 1990, the song Sliver, and the autumn of that year, Something in the Way. Story songs, in summary, make up six of the 68 songs with lyrics released during Nirvana's lifetime or on the greatest hits slash with the lights out box packages in 2002-2004. Polly is based on a news story. Paper cuts on an incident that happened to a local kid. Floyd the Barber is a fictitious grotesque scene based on a TV show. And three of the songs, Mexican Seafood, Sliver, and Something in the Way, are embellished autobiographies. The way in which, between 88 to 1990, he moves towards autobiography is reinforced by other trends in his writing. The second form is even more prominent in Kurt's early work, the character sketch. The fecal matter demo is a point of origin in two respects. Firstly, Cobain is still finding his own voice, so it's significant how often he speaks as the other people on the record. Note the bizarre put-on voices throughout the demo an affection still prominent in the unusual voices on the January 88 songs later seen on Incesticide. Secondly, this seeking out of identities is also lyrical. The song Laminated Effect is the only time Kurt sketches named characters, Johnny and Lucy respectively, while the song Buffy's Pregnant marries his vocal impersonations to stereotypical dialogue of the types of individuals he's representing. Mrs. Buttersworth, in which he hashes out a would-be homemade folk art entrepreneur's future plans, continues this lyrical approach in which he visibly speaks as another person. He gives up on vocal impersonations very swiftly, and very soon it becomes less obvious he's speaking as a character or autobiographically. The B-side to Nirvana's first single, Big Cheese, has started life as a tale of management at a fast food joint. Then, it evolved into a comment on the management at Sub Pop. There'd also been Hairspray Queen and If You Must, both of which were recorded in January of 88, while Sappy was demoed in 88. The peak for the character sketch, though, was his dominance on Bleach, which contained about a girl, school, negative creep, scoff, 
Swap Meat and Mr. Mustache. Things had visibly changed by the time of Nevermind. The story song had dwindled into a single song, Something in the Way, and there were only two character sketches, Lithium and Drain You, both of which could be read as autobiographical. That's not to say, however, that Kurt hadn't persisted with this mode of writing. Stain, Been a Son, and Even in His Youth were all written in a flurry around the summer and autumn of 1989. Then, in 1990, Kurt also created Dumb, Penny Royalty, and Oh the Guilt. Early versions of Rape Me were also far more extensive than what would ultimately emerge in 1993. I've said it a lot of times that so few Cobain compositions are written after Nevermind that it's hard to draw big conclusions. But by the end of his life, as far as we can see, the only additions to this form were Kermagen, written some point in 1991, then Very Ape, and Sentless Apprentice. A form that had taken up over half of Nirvana's first album remained as a full four songs on Nirvana's final album, but made up only two of the dozen compositions he's known to have written during the last two and a half years of his life. Still, it's a significant batch of Cobain productivity, 23 of the 68 songs taken into account in this assessment. The curious part, however, is seeing the rise of the third song form Cobain used, Bleach was made up of one cover song, two story songs left over from the January 88 session, six character sketches, and just two songs in the mode that Kurt would become best known for and that would dominate his later writing. Blue and Sifting are forged from lines that sound good together, related words, brief images, lines addressed to an unknown audience. There's no central narrative and no singular character here. I refer to these as the abstract address. Detached images, opinions, feelings combined into songs. Downer is the nearest fecal matter came to this, though there was a central theme at play. Note, by the way, that Downer starts with an anonymous narration, then breaks into the first person. Kurt would do the same thing on Spank Through, Mexican Seafood, Big Long Now, Dive, Smells Like Teen Spirit, Drain You, Scentless Apprentice, and Radio Friendly Unit Shifter. Opening lines in one mode, the rest in another. Oddly, Downer, Arrow Zeppelin, and Sifting would be the last songs Kurt wrote that are entirely anonymous with no I, he, or she involved. Just another small evolution in his style. Spank Through was the next form in this mode, followed by Blue and Sifting. Increasingly, this is how Kurt would come to write. Lines taken from different journals or scribbled out relatively close to the time of recording. If you look at something like Teen Spirit, for instance, ideas barely linger longer than a couple of lines. Elsewhere, try In Bloom, with its chorus refrain existing entirely separately from the verse themes, which are themselves fairly diffuse. Sell the kids for food, weather changes mood, spring is here again, reproductive glands. On Nevermind, there were two story songs, Polly and Something in the Way, then two character sketches, Lithium and Drain You, and then the rest of the album consisted of this abstract tone. In Utero, again, would divide up relatively cleanly. No story songs, four character sketches, the rest is abstract. The abstract tone was, by its very nature, a highly adaptable form. Note the change between Nevermind's unspecific combination of broad statements of opinion and imagery versus In Utero's targeted clusters of autobiographical reference. Cobain fixates on the media on In Utero. It isn't uncommon either for fame to impose a certain introversion on lyrics, essentially. Once all an artist sees is hotel rooms, stages, and business meetings, it's hard for them to say much about the world. Think of Axl Rose moving from the grime of Appetite for Destruction to the love songs and psychological dissections on Use Your Illusion. Or, more specifically, compare that to Chinese democracy after a decade stuck in a mansion. Recently, The Weeknd's new album was filled with the least interesting, specific, and developed writing of his career. In conversation the other week, someone drew my eye to Do Re Mi and pointed to it as a quintessential heroin song comparable to the narcotized drift of Lennon's Imagine or Lou Reed's Perfect Day. There's this air of blissed out, warm nothingness to it all. It reminded me again that there's more to meet the eye inside the music of Kurt Cobain. End quote. Now, I want to show you guys a couple of clips from various interviews I've done with various Nirvana producers, Steve Albini, Steve Fisk, and Jack and Dino, where they touch on how Kurt Cobain approached recording vocals. If you want to see the full interview with either of these three producers, the links are available in the description box below. 
All of the interviews on this channel are arranged independently by myself. If you want to support, the best way to do so is simply to subscribe, share the video, like the video, and thanks for watching. One of the distinctive elements of In Utero, in my opinion, is the raspiness of Kurt's voice. Like, I mean, he screams at all the records, but I really find with Bleach and In Utero in particular, he's really letting loose. Um, with a song like Tourette's, he's basically just screaming the whole time. Uh, did he ever blow out his voice when he was uh, recording that record? I don't recall anything specific, although he basically sang the whole album in one go, and I think he paced it so that the less demanding songs would be early in the session, and then the harsher songs would be at the end. And then I do recall him coming in the next day and revisiting a couple of those songs, either redoing parts or whole chunks of songs. The first song you guys did was Serve the Servants. Did you get yeah. any of the arrangements for the music before you started recording or was everything just you get there and for the first time you're hearing these songs? They had sent me Rio demo, which was a demo tape that they had made in Rio de Janeiro that had most of the songs from the session and a few loose jams. The arrangements were all pretty worked out, you know, and Kurt had ideas about for each song he had little extra bits that he wanted to do either a second guitar or uh, a contrasting uh part he wanted to to add that was not that wasn't necessarily structural but there would be like okay well we get to this bit it's going to be a second guitar that's going to take over or you're going to join and um yeah there wasn't a, not a lot of it was extemporaneous. Hmm. Almost all of it was, in one way or another, was worked out. You know, Kurt had a notebook that had his lyrics and his song ideas in it. In that notebook, he also had articulated specific things about the guitar sound. Like he wanted to swap amplifiers for certain songs. He used a, a Randall amplifier for some of it. He mm -hmm. used the bulk of it was this broken Fender quad reverb that he really liked. Serve the Servant specifically, I know that he used this broken quad reverb, and it was missing three of the four power tubes. So the output of the amplifier was, in technical terms, it was asymmetrical, meaning that there would be distortion on one half of the waveform and not on the other half. And that would be, you know, an unusual thing, but it and it had a very harsh, distorted sound, but uh, Kurt was actually quite fond of that harshness. And, and so that was a, a big part of that record was him choosing a very specific voicing for each guitar. Is there anything in particular about these sessions that stick out to you? There are a couple of very specific things about Kurt's approach that um, were unique at the time and remain unique. Um, he, he essentially sang the entire album in one sitting. Really? Um, I think he came back the next day and did a few of the songs that... You know, he may have redone a song or did a few of the songs that he didn't get to the first day. But essentially, we started the vocal tracking and then we just pressed on that whole day and he sang the whole album. Um, <clears throat> that by itself is pretty unusual. Um, his approach to singing was that while he was singing, he always wanted to be playing an instrument of some kind. In the beginning, he had this percussion instrument called a rain stick that he was toying with while he was doing the vocals. Mm -hmm. And it, it made this, you know, brutal rattling sound that was picking up in the vocal microphones. And then when he heard the first playback, he was like, hey, can you get rid of that rain stick? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sorry, that's built in, you know. So he ended up re-singing that song. But, um, and then he switched to this slightly broken acoustic guitar he had this acoustic guitar that had a cracked top and had very old very dead strings and he would just strum along quietly while he was preparing to sing the song and there are a couple of songs where you can hear this acoustic guitar sort of accompanying the quiet bits of the verse and that wasn't a separate recording of an acoustic guitar that was just the acoustic guitar he was carrying in his lap that he was using as a, a, a um, sort of a rhythmic confidence item during the singing. And so that acoustic guitar was uh, a byproduct of his method of 
recording the vocals. I felt like he was being very square and very open with me during the session. Like he would tell me what he liked and what he didn't like. And I believed him, Mm -hmm. you know, and he would tell me what his aesthetic inspirations were for certain things. When it comes specifically to Kurt's screaming, I think Bleach is the best sample of how intense his screams could be. Does it take a certain technique to be able to scream like that? Or how is how is he going about doing that? It, it's not a technique thing. It's a natural thing. You either have it or you don't. It's your voice does it, your throat does it, or, or it doesn't. I mean, yeah, it's a technique, but I mean, he didn't have enough practice uh, or live experience or anything else to have anything that you would call a technique. He was just natural. Um, he had a good scream, and I was very impressed with it right from the get-go. I thought, this guy's got a great scream. He's got a good voice. I could tell that he had an interesting ear for melody, because what melodies there were were interesting melodies and didn't always follow the guitar riff. So there was a little bit of thought in it. So you could just tell that he had a natural rock scream that was really good. That was obvious right from the first chorus of of if you must, you know, as you immediately you'd, you'd go, whoa, well, okay, listen to his voice, you know, going up a notch here. So, um, yeah, I liked his singing right off the bat. And I believe I probably said so at the time because I remember Dale Crover agreeing with me about that exact thing. I guess from a technical standpoint, when you're recording someone who's screaming, uh, do you have to set the mic up in a different way than when they're not screaming, just in order so it doesn't boom out? Like, how do, how do you go about that technically? Technically, if I'm dealing with somebody who screams a lot, I shy away from condenser microphones entirely, uh, which puts me slightly on the outside of a lot of recording technique, I guess. Um, I favor dynamic microphones for rock screamers. It just sounds more natural to me. It's less sibilant. You don't get as much sort of spitty sizzly artifacts, what we call sibilance, isn't as prevalent. It doesn't tend to be as shrill. Condenser microphones, which are generally higher fidelity, tend to be not very flattering to a lot of singers who are screamy. They can make them sound very shrill and unpleasant. Um, Strangely enough, if you give somebody a Beta 58 or a Sennheiser 421 or just a Shure SM58 or something like that, Maybe put a foam thing over it so they can eat the mic, as we say, um, which gives them more of a feeling just like they're on stage because they're singing like this instead of into a mic that's far away. Mm -hmm. Um, You get the proximity effect of the microphone working in your favor, but the pop filter that's over the mic is keeping the plosives from happening. Uh, Long story short, you can set up, and I've done this many times, I'll set up like four or five microphones just in a row and let, you know, I'll say, okay, sing me a couple of lines of the loudest part of the song, and we'll just go through and we'll just A-B them, and we'll pick the mic. And generally with screamy singers, it's going to be a dynamic microphone, um, and all the expensive condensers are going to be left behind. Now, that's just my experience. Your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. But in Kurt's case, in 1988, most likely I just had him singing into an SM58 with a pop filter, and I might have even let him hold it in his hand. Um, don't think so, though. Because he would not have been a hand holder. He was used to playing with a guitar, so he would never have, he would never have sung into the mic with it holding in his hand. I have other people do that. Mark Lanigan sang into a, uh, mm-hmm. an SM58, holding it in his hand for the winding sheet record. Sometimes the simple, obvious microphone is actually the best microphone to use, even though you may want to use the $5,000 microphone. It's not always the best choice. It really depends on the voice and the technique that's involved. The last few years, having gotten to speak with Jack and Dino and Steve Albini and people who've actually worked with the band, it it kind of corrects a lot of the the false images that there are of the band out there. Like there's this kind of image that like sometimes Kurt is portrayed as a bit of a slacker, someone who didn't really care too much. But speaking with Steve and with Jack, they both said that he, he was very serious in the studio. So that was, you had the same experience with him essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did he approach recording vocals? Was there anything unique about his approach? No, he just did it. Hmm. I mean, when, yeah, yeah, he just stood in front of the the microphone. It was a very good microphone. Neumann U67, um, same one we used for beat happening and 
anybody else that recorded there. Uh, and it, you know, he just sounded great. He just was a natural born singer. Just did that. A lot of people don't understand. There were so many good singers of that generation. Like within five years, I recorded Sean Smith, Reggie Watts, Chris Cornell, Calvin Johnson, Kurt Cobain, Mark Lanigan, and a lot of other great singers that no one knows about or, you know, other people know about. So so the idea that uh, you just, oh, well, yeah, this is taking care of itself, you know, but put Kurt in front of a Neumann mic, put it through this compressor, and we're in business, you know, it just, it just sounded perfect. So cool. And, and just happened organically and happened in one or two takes, you know. That's awesome. And was he easy to work with in the studio? Yes. That's cool. So when yeah, we had we had fun. It was a good time. Okay, so they they come to the studio, you start working with them. When did you first like was it right away you saw, okay, these guys are like like he's a natural born singer, or like did it take a few takes for for that to come through? Oh, I knew that from the bleach record. Hmm. You know, I mean they just sounded great. You know, he had uh they call it a vocal fry. He had a place where his voice went into overtones and I picked up all these harmonics and it's just a classic thing that you know great rock singers have. Hmm. And uh yeah, you could hear that all over the stuff. And then believe me, I heard Bleach without ever I don't think I ever put put the record on in my house. I heard Bleach so many fucking times. <laughs> you know, by the time I recorded Nirvana because it got played on the radio or it got played in restaurants and all this and uh but yeah, there was a there's a whole thing when uh, when a band's getting ready to track, and especially a guy like me because I came to engineering later on than some people, so uh, I work hard, maybe harder than some folks because I, I'm really trying to, you know, not fuck up and do the best gig I can. But yeah, when you've got three people playing and you know 12, 20 mics all happening, you're running around checking this and that, and checking levels, and you've got a tape machine and there's all these things that can go wrong or overmodulate or uh, and what have you, and then you get, oh, vocal. Oh, no, that's, you know, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> you get to sort of like in the middle of all of this shit, you go, oh, yeah, there you go. There's the vocal, <laughs> you know, and it yeah. just sounded perfect. It was just like him out in the room with the cymbals bleeding into everything, and he was just totally delivering, you know, uh, on the on the basic, not even as an overdub, just, you know, while, while the band's laying down the, with the basic, while he's doing allegedly a, a scratch vocal, he's just delivering it as if he was playing live, you know. That's amazing. So, so, so you mentioned about a minute ago that you also work with Chris Cornell. Was his approach to recording vocals different than Kurt's? Like, how would you compare the two of them as singers in the studio? You have to understand, both these guys I worked on records that were Econo records, and there wasn't any time for screwing around. And so both these guys just went in and did their part and didn't fuck around. And later, you know, Cornell figured out all these ways to record and recorded himself a lot and chased everybody out of the room. I wasn't around for any of that. The nineties to early nineties to a certain extent. And then the eighties, definitely they don't fit well onto the internet. And so it's not very well documented. And there are just a lot of stories and a lot of things that happened when, you know, people had VHS cameras, but they didn't have their phone, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, only so many things got recorded, only so many people did interviews, only, you know, uh, you know, when I was recording The Screaming Trees on an Atari MX5050B, Jack and Dino was recording Nirvana and Soundgarden on an Atari MX5050B, Dinosaur Jr. back in, uh, Boston, in Boston was being recorded on an Atari MX5050B down in L.A., Whisker Dewar being recorded on MX 5050B. So everyone was using the same half inch A track. Certain mm -hmm. things were like, okay, that, that's a 1985 sound. That's a 1984 sound, you know, uh, and then you can hear it. It's all over the records. Mm -hmm. People don't, don't really understand that. People are excited about tape. People want to know about all of this, but it, it's, a, it's an odd one. So anyway, thank, thank you for your efforts in, uh, looking into, you know, the past and, and uh, some of the early days and all of this. No stuff. problem. I, I appreciate that. I really like the 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 old stories of how things got to where they were. Like, I'm, I love history. So I feel like with Nirvana, because they're such a big band, and, like, people just look at them, they look at them just as stars, but they don't, they don't look at the early part of how they got there. So I love uncovering these little stories about what things actually were like.